Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, today is session three, I believe, of our Public Pre-K Technical Assistance Series. I'm Nicole Medora, the Early Childhood Specialist here at the department on the Early Learning Team. And I have my colleague, Sue, here. Sue, did you want to introduce yourself real quick? Yes, my name is Sue Galant. I am the um, Pre-K Expansion Consultant with the Early Learning Team, and I'll be providing technical assistance to the MJRP districts. Great. And then we do also have Marcy Wickham is our public pre-K consultant on our team. Um, Marcy is typically here. She's on a site visit today. So hopefully she'll pop in, but she just may be late. So I just wanted to give folks a heads up there. And then the rest of our team, um, our director is Leanne Larson. And then we also have Stacy McCoy as our Head Start State Collaboration Director and Jane Kersling is our pre-K grant coordinator. Um, so some familiar faces and names for folks to know there. Okay, we're going to dive right in. So our topics today, we have lots of information to provide. Um, some, as always, are requirements and expectations of public pre-K programs, while others are just strictly recommendations and, and strong encouragements. Um, but we like to always share both because we know that communities across our state with public pre-K programs operate much differently, um, rightly so. So we just want to make sure that everybody has the tools that they need to do the highest quality um, program that they can. So today's topics, we're going to look at student recruitment, as well as student enrollment and screening of students. Um, so like I said, we've got a wealth of information that's <laughs> about to uh, come your way. Um, and whenever something is required or expected, we'll make sure that we highlight that. Um, and if anything is just a strict recommendation, then we'll make sure to decipher the two. I'm going to hand it over to Sue to get us started on some community needs. And go from there. Sure. So at this point in the game, if we have your contact information, it's likely that you've already accomplished this step. But we just want to go over the fact that it is really important to do a community needs assessment. It's required that districts demonstrate coordination with other early childhood programs in the community, whether that be your local Head Start or child care providers that are operating either in home-based or center-based care. You know, a survey is a good idea for collecting that information. Also tracking your communication efforts with and work with them. Uh, we certainly don't want to be in the position of putting businesses, child care businesses out of business. We want to be able to work collaboratively in every opportunity possible. Um, tracking your communication efforts and notifying the DOE in your application, which you've likely already done, and also providing public notice regarding the proposal um, to the community that you're serving. The pl Your plan for um, pre-K, looking at the needs of your students, considering your enrollment numbers from kindergarten, and assuring that your communication strategies are culturally responsive and accessible to all. All right, I'm going to move where I have people so I can see. There you go. Um, so the next step after where we all, many of you are right now, is recruitment. And we really want to make sure that we're tailoring our recruitment efforts to the specific needs of your individual community. So you know how to best reach or will be working on ways to best reach the folks in your, your town. Coordinating with the town office is always important. They can provide you birth numbers and help you estimate what your anticipated enrollment will be. And they also often have communications teams that can help you get the word out. Your primary grade enrollment in your particularly your kindergarten numbers can also help you identify the number of students that you can anticipate el being eligible for your program. Community notices, getting the word out through the community, letting families and folks know that your program is up and running and enrollment is open is really important. And then we also want to consider needs of any partner agencies that you're working with, if applicable, if that be the Head Start agency or a child care provider. Specific outreach to community agencies and local providers is also um, an important piece. They are kind of our feeder program coming in. And so connecting with them really helps you with recruitment and getting kiddos to your program. Word of mouth certainly is a great way to spread news about your program and social media increasingly is having an important role in sharing information with our communities. And then we just really want to talk about other ideas and strategies. So I'm wondering, Cheryl and Loralee, what um, have you done in your programs 
thus far for recruitment. Um, sorry, my camera's being weird. Um, we've mostly done work from within. I mean, right now, I'm not sure um, how much we've done beyond that. I mean, we've adver advertised um, the positions, but mm -hmm. we have a lot of interest from within as well. Great. Cheryl, how about you? Well, our enrollment numbers are really quite low this year, even though we've added um, full day program, which we thought would increase our numbers. Mm -hmm. um, so we've, you know, of course, used our Facebook pages. We've sent uh, flyers home in backpacks, asking, you know, family members, cousins, so forth, um, children that are friends of the family, neighbors, all of that. You know, please spread the word. Uh, we'll mail out registration packets. You can stop in and pick them up. We um, tied it into our kindergarten screening day and said, if you have prospective pre-K age children, please come by the school. We'll help you with the pre-K registration. You can um, take a little tour of the school, see the kindergarten class in action. You'll see where the classroom would be, what it would be like. Um, we've really been trying to rack our brains, trying, and I was kind of excited to see this topic today because it is something um, right now, we don't have the numbers to accept our expansion grant. So, um, we thought right, well, we'd be all set, so. <laughs> Nicole, if you want to go to the next slide, I can share some of the ideas I've collected over the past few years um, from personal experience and also from other districts. So it's always great to see the great things that are happening. Announcing that your registration is open far and wide using your school and district web pages. And I really recommend that if you're in a school system where there are multiple buildings, you know, at the primary, middle, and high school that you posted on all the web pages, if you can, with a banner. It's surprising how many um, high school students have younger pre-K siblings who come in. I've seen that increase in the past few years. So also using your student information system to get that information out to your pre-K or kindergarten through 12 families. Um, electronic signs in the district are also helpful many schools and, and that is not specific just to school signs, but if you can connect with your town office and other places that have those. Sometimes there are faith-based organizations that have signs. Connecting with those community partners is a great way to get the word out. Newsletters and those things, even have middle school and high school principals add that to their communication. And then on district and school social media. And the next posty, making connections with community members and asking them to share your information. Certainly connecting with those child care providers. I know um, for me, when I was a pre-K coordinator, I always made flyers up and took those to the child care programs. We also had brochures that we distributed to our local medical and dental offices, as well as child care providers. Our local library always had some on hand and they allowed us to post flyers there. And then agencies that serve families. The local WIC office, um, if you have a housing program like Bangor Housing or the Caleb Foundation that provides um, affordable housing to families, even landlords in the area that you know are um, supporting families, often connecting with them so that they, um, thank you, Laura Lee, that they are able to help you connect. And then employers. Sometimes you can find employers who will be willing. We had in the town I live in, a huge new seafood processing plant go in. And I know that the district that has pre-K in this town has sent flyers and information to them so that they can partner with them and help them connect in with their public pre-K. Next slide. So again, I mentioned flyers at all your district schools, the library, town hall, WIC offices. I've recruited a lot of kiddos through putting up flyers at the laundromat. A lot of our families need to go there and have had um, families let me know that that's where they saw our signs. Discount stores, so your dollar stores, your dollar generals, grocery stores, small convenience stores, you know, that you know are frequented by families in your community. That's where it's tailoring that to your community. Where do all the families go? 
where's everybody stopping on their way home from work if they need to pick something up? Um, playgrounds, if you laminate flyers um, using maybe not the big school laminators, but the smaller personal laminators with the heavy five mil sheets, they last pretty well. Um, you can attach them with zip ties to the chain link fences and that's another place where you can connect with families. Mailbox areas and apartment complexes. We had a fielder's choice move in across the street from our school and they really helped us get the word out when they opened. They opened happened to open in March and it was perfect timing for us. We had them put up a flyer in their window and they had brochures. Many of our former students work there and they were able to hand those out and that really hit a lot of folks in the community and prompted them coming in. We've also had to get creative and I've seen a lot of different districts do different things. Um, a suggestion that came in actually from another state was partnering with a local pizza shop to include a small flyer with delivery orders. They recommended doing that on Super Bowl Sunday so that the word was getting out broadly in the community. Um, we have joined our Head Start partners in the Memorial Day Parade when numbers were low and we were still looking for students, tossing out a candy or a small toy with a message about the program and contact information. And then we've also engaged area businesses in providing small prizes, gift cards. Um, one of the local stores that does games did a family game basket to incentivize completing registrations by a certain date. We found two things get families to kind of pay attention. When there's food, they'll come to a family engagement event. And when there's an incentive prize that they have a chance, if you get your registration in by you know, May 1st, you'll be eligible in the drawing. And that really brought folks in. We really struggled with a lot of kiddos, even though they've lived in town for many years, their families knew about the program. They wouldn't enroll them until the first week of school as they brought their older siblings in. So we wanted to get them in sooner so they could be part of our screening. And Sue, next. can I add one thing to that too? That um, I Sorry, I should have added this earlier, but I was just thinking, um, Personally, when I receive outreach from families asking about their um, community's public pre-K offerings, nine times out of 10, nine and a half times out of 10, it's families that are moving to a new area that are asking, you know, does this new, does this location that's new to me offer public pre-K? If so, what is it? If, if so, who do I contact? So I'm also would just throw out there, um, if you have any realtors in your town, um, new build, new homes, new buildings, new apartments that are being constructed um, to include them in some of your outreach, because often that can make or break somebody's decision, not necessarily just pre-K, but what offerings in general for education in the area exist. Um, so making those folks aware too of what you have to offer families coming in with young children um, can really help to get the word out there and get some, some kids signed in. So That's a great sorry. idea. Thanks, Sue. Um, also, getting a jump on future years. If you're out recruiting and you're meeting a three-year-old or a two-year-old, jot their name and contact info down. I've kept a book for years in my, my desk, and I was talking with a local superintendent recently who said that he started tracking this information in their student information system. He puts them as a, a class, like they'll, he'll do pre-K minus one for the kiddos who will be eligible next year and minus two, and then he just needs to migrate them forward. And I thought that was a great idea, far better than my posty notes and little in, in handwritten notebook. But, um, you know, it's a great idea to keep track of the kiddos, siblings that are born and know who's coming. And then making a connection. Um, quite often, folks may be skeptical about a public school program for their little kiddos, but when they meet and begin to develop trust with the professionals who are going to be running that program, then they're more likely to enroll their children. So attending the preschool story hour at the local library and talking about your program, just being a presence, hosting family fun events in your own school. So, you know, when we're doing that, you know, March, Dr. Seuss's birthday thing, having a program at your school for the preschoolers, the zero to four-year-olds to come in and, um, or doing a playground program. We've done games on the playground, family picnic on the playground and staff are there to facilitate activities. And it really builds that trust. And I think that's a big piece when folks are bringing their little ones to us. 
Yeah, and I would also say too, it, when you are thinking of flyers or communication formats out for the community, um, any opportunity that you can to remind families that your program is free <laughs> um, and that there's no pre-qualifiers needed or necessary for a child to register. Um, Obviously, if you're not a universal program, then you may have a wait list and making that known is good too. We'll chat about that in a few more minutes as well. Um, but my point being, many families that have four-year-olds who are eligible to enter pre-K, and if this is their first child entering the school system, a, may not be aware that pre-K program exists in their community, and B, not be, may not be aware that it's free of cost for them, that it's part of the public school system, and that, you know, what that comes with in terms of meals, transportation, um, any services that you provide, things like that. So anytime that you get the opportunity to sort of really brag about what you can offer to the family, do it, um, whether that's in writing or verbal or just a quick elevator pitch um, to really sell the program for anybody that's curious. And we often will receive outreach from families to asking um, what their child needs to know to enter pre-K, um, which I just chuckle because your child doesn't need to know anything, right? So reminding them that all children are welcome and encouraged to, to register and be screened and, and hopefully um, enrolled into the program um, can really ease any questions or maybe hesitations that a family might have. Okay, let's get moving to the next. All right, so we're going to shift gears a little bit. So we've talked about um, a lot of really great ways to start recruiting for students for your program. And then once you've started that those recruitment efforts, certainly you're going to start to have families out, excuse me, reach out um, to start the registration or, or the enrollment process. Uh, so there's a few things to keep in mind when doing this. So one thing is that uh, we really strongly encourage all districts that have pre-K programs to have a written enrollment protocol, especially if you're a non-universal program, meaning you don't have space in your pre-K program for every child that lives in your community, right? And you're bound to maybe have a wait list. So we want to make sure that folks are really clear, as clear as possible, first and foremost, um, so that families know what they're signing up for. And also, if you do have to have a wait list, if you're not universal program, um, making families know that they should still enroll, right? They should still show up because um, sometimes families will say, oh, there's a wait list. My, that's OK. I'll, I'm not even I won't bother. Right. I'll just save a space. And that's OK. They can do that. But really wanting to encourage that sometimes wait lists do get moved through or if you're um, able to expand, who knows? Uh, just encouraging those things. So when folks, schools uh, get ready to think about a written enrollment protocol, these are some of the things that we think uh, we should remember to include. First, that it should be it should clearly document the number of students that can be enrolled. So you should be very clear that, you know, we offer two classrooms. Our classrooms are capped at 16 students each. Therefore, we can only enroll 32 students um, or, or whatever the case may be for you. So making that clear first and foremost. And then from there, outlining the process that the school will take to identify those students. And this is really a decision that's made locally. Um, it's not something that we require a certain way. Um, there's a variety of thoughts and ways that schools go about this. A really common one is a lottery. Others will do it on a first come first served basis based on complete registration packets. Um, other schools would do random, right? If they have, can take 32 students and they have 50 registration packets, they'll put those names in some kind of a bucket and just pull out 32. Um, so there's really uh, no right or wrong way necessarily, but uh, a variety of ways. Um, and, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about the lottery system in just a minute as well. So something else to consider is to or to write in your protocol is to identify considerations for and the management of a potential wait list, right? So again, just putting it all out there from the get-go. Um, if you have a wait list, what is your protocol for doing that? Are you, if a spot opens up, are you going to go to the very next person? Will that wait list be managed in a lottery or random way? You know, that's up to you to decide, but um, letting folks know is will be good. Um, highlight how your classroom placement decisions will be made. So if you have more than one pre-K classroom, let families know how you choose which students go where. If you operate on an AM and PM schedule, some schools will ask parents, do you have a preference morning or afternoon? 
Um, and if they do, honoring that the best you can, other schools might say, no, we don't ask for preference, we just assign and go from there, right? And, and hopefully it all works out um, or we can uh, manage you know, minute details as needed if families really have a, a preference uh, based on what they've received. We encourage folks to offer a clear timeline and how notification of decisions will be provided to families, right? Not leaving anybody in the dark. This is when our registration is due. This is when we'll pull names, do our lottery, et cetera. Families will know your child's classroom placement by such and such date. This is how those decisions were made. If we have a wait list, et cetera. Um, just putting that all out there. We also encourage fam or families, we encourage schools <laughs> to think about um, ways that your program can make every effort to serve the communities that are most of our most vulnerable populations um, with a, a heterogeneous mix of students. So what we find often is when, especially in those first come first served scenarios, is when a school district announces that they're taking registrations for pre-K for the following year, on a first come first served basis, then those families that are that receive the communication that are privy to the communication that have a means of completing everything that the registration packet requires, meaning birth certificates, vaccinations, etc. They're likely the ones that are going to get everything in as soon as possible. And the first 16 students that do that fill a classroom. And we can't guarantee that that's going to be a heterogeneous mix of students, right? It may be a very homogeneous mix. So what I mean by this is looking at your students' registration packets and sort of um, organizing them by students' abilities that, that they're aware of, families' economic status, culture and or language needs, things like that, and starting to sort of filter through to see what types of populations of families we have in the community that we're looking to serve and how we can best meet the needs of them in a fair and equitable way. And to have that, we know research tells us that students learn best among peers that aren't necessarily of the same development as they are or of the same background and culture as they are. So having that heterogeneous mix is a really a, a benefit for all. This is just a quick sample enrollment policy. This is available in our pre-K guidebook as well in one of the um, appendices. And this just shows a lottery system. So this particular district, this is an actual district's enrollment policy, I've just de-identified it, um, highlights right at the top of their communication to their families that students must be four years old by October 15th, that's law, <laughs> um, that's not a recommendation, that's a requirement, um, and that families must complete the lottery registration form, which they provide for them in the packet. And at this time, they were completing the free and reduced lunch application. Um, that's still available, but because school lunch is free to all, um, that may or may not be something that you need to have there. And that all forms must be completed and submitted by a certain date. I left this date here, but certainly you would edit that. And then they enter into a lottery. So their lottery A is children who currently have an IEP determined by CDS. Lottery B are children who qualify for economically disadvantaged services based on their free and reduced lunch application form. And then lottery C is children who do not qualify for economically disadvantaged services based on that form. So then what they do is they categorize students in one of these three. And they also, the rest of this letter does say how many students they're able to enroll in each of the lottery. So if you're looking to possibly mirror the rest of your K-12 population's percentages, then this is where you would do that. So for example, if your K-12 population has a 10% special education rate, then if we mirror that in pre-K, 10% of a classroom is, would be 1.6 or maybe two seats. So then underneath this lottery, you would say two children will enter the lottery A. And then if your K-12 population serves a 50% rate of um, free and reduced lunch qualifier students, then you might reserve half of your seats in that classroom um, or about seven or eight seats for students who qualify for free and reduced lunch. And then the remaining seats would be filled by students who, who fall under lottery C. And that's what we mean by creating a heterogeneous mix of students, as well as a classroom that mirrors the population of your K-12 students recommended, not required. <laughs> okay. 
So we've gone through a few steps here. We've recruited some students. We've started the enrollment process. And now we've got some names on a roster that we're ready to split into classrooms um, or, and move forward with uh, notifying families that their children will be eligible and able to enter the school in the public pre-K program next year. So once we've got that list of names, we're gonna start the screening process. Um, and really the purpose of screening, as we all know, the ch is child find, which is the process of identifying students with disabilities. And screenings and evaluations are provided in order to identify children who are eligible for services. Now, if you have students register who already have an IEP with CDS, then there's really no need to have them go through the screening process, right? Because clearly that process has already been done for them somewhere else and at an earlier time and has resulted in an IEP for that student. Um, they will still need their health screening, which we'll chat about in a moment as well. Um, but for the purposes of child find, they've already been found, so we're all set. Um, but for all of the other students on your enrollment list, uh, they will need to be screened um, prior to or within 30 days of the school year starting. So we don't say, uh, or when I say we, I mean the Department of Education does not identify which tool must be used for the screening purpose, the developmental screening purpose. Um, that's a local decision. We are able to give you, be a thought partner in making those decisions or give you some ideas of where you might look for recommendations. And actually that website down at the bottom um, below this child's face here is a, a resource document that shows some options that schools could, you know, sort of filter through. It's sort of like a consumer report for screening tools. The four that I have listed here are, are certainly the most common that we here schools are using. Um, the developmental indicators for the assessment of learning or better known as the dial four, meaning the fourth edition. That also comes with what they call a speed dial. So either one of those. The early screening inventory or the EZP or the EZK, depending on the chronological chronological age of the child you're screening are common ones. The Brigantz isn't as common anymore, but does still exist. Um, and then ages and stages questionnaire um, is a great supplement as well. That's a, a document that teachers and families fill out um, either together or families individually to gain even more information on the child's development. So this, this is not the end all be all list, but these are certainly the ones that we hear of most commonly. And I did put that link in the chat for you so that you can access the document. And I will just say, if you're using the dial or the, you know, the ASQ, also it's really helpful to have the information from the families. And the dial also does have a parent questionnaire in there that you can use. Yes, thank you, Sue, for saying that. I mentioned that, forgot to mention that. Um, as you're preparing to set up or organize your screening dates. These are sort of like four next big steps that we would uh, encourage schools to think through. So clearly communicating with families is a big one. The timing of the screening, the format of the screening day, and then of course working with CDS. So my next four slides are gonna take us through some steps in each of these topics. So first and foremost, communicating with families. Consider scheduling a variety of screening dates and times to accommodate all families. Um, so sometimes schools will um, uh, not cancel a school day, but utilize a school day and have their pre-K teachers conduct screenings. Sometimes schools will do it over the summer when there's no school in session at all. Um, some schools will do it on half or early release days. So that's up to you to decide, but just be mindful of, of families and working families and their needs in terms of accessing the screening location. If you can, try and identify any barriers for families to attend and address them each as you're able. So for example, if families have transportation needs, perhaps you can offer to do the screening in their home. Perhaps you might have access to a school bus or a school vehicle that could provide transportation to and from the, the location. Um, many families may have language barriers, so uh, working with a translator is needed. Some families have childcare needs for younger siblings, um, so be mindful of that. If, or even if the child that you're looking to screen attends a childcare, um, be mindful of that as well, and perhaps going to that location and or providing um, momentary childcare at the school during the screening time. Um, remember, screening doesn't have to take 
all day. <laughs> it certainly shouldn't take all day, um, but a, a matter of, uh, of a few minutes, 15, 20, maybe 30, depending on the child and, and how the child is moving through the screening tool. Um, so just being aware of younger siblings and childcare needs as well as the overall comfort of the parent entering the school. So we know that public school is not always a warm and fuzzy feeling for many families. Um, and if this is their first experience, their first child experiencing the public school process, um, they may not yet be comfortable coming to the school. Um, so just keeping that in the back of your mind if you feel that you're struggling to reach a certain family and offering other options, maybe areas in the community to meet, libraries, playgrounds, may not be the best setting for a screening, but certainly uh, other options that uh, you can offer to meet their needs. Anytime that you can send reminders and follow up communication and create a safe and welcoming space and be flexible. So no matter where you are, no matter what you're doing with the location, the setting, make sure that it's a space that everybody can feel safe to provide information to you um, and a, a space where they can feel safe to ask questions, interact with you, um, and that is welcoming to not only the family, but to the child as well. And flexibility, of course, is if you're in the world of education, you have to be flexible. <laughs> so timing of the screening. <clears throat> Pre-K students must complete a screening within the first 30 days of attendance. So there are many schools that conduct their pre-K screening in the spring, so right now, prior to the pre-K starting year. Um, so this has some really great benefits. This is not a requirement or a recommendation, quite frankly. It's just an option that some schools take, take us up on. Um, identifying students in the spring um, can identify each student's needs much sooner. Therefore, you may be able to make a referral for further evaluation much sooner, getting that um, evaluation, a potential IEP, any services that may need to be provided happening sooner over the summer. Um, the results of your pre-K screening can also help teachers balance pre-K classrooms if you have multiple classrooms that you need to that you're looking to fill. Um, and then also it's gonna give you a longer period of time to rescreen. So it's not uncommon for a student to come to the screening, go through the process of everything and teachers that are conducting it to kind of feel on the edge, like they performed well, but they were a little distracted or um, they didn't perform well, but I think it was because they were nervous, right? There's always those sort of fine print, fine line students. So conducting that in the spring and then offering to rescreen that child when they're in session in the fall um, gives a lot of time for that student to grow and mature. And of course, the other option is at the end of the summer, um, end of August, beginning of September. A benefit to this is that students grow and mature a lot through the summer months. So really giving them that time th to grow through the summer and then come to you for the first time at the end. And then there's less time lost between seeing the school and actually entering it. So those springtime screening dates is often the first time the student is coming to the school and seeing the classroom. And then they go potentially all summer and then poof back in in September. That's okay. Some students transition quite well with that in mind. Others may or may not. Having your screening date at the end of summer and then having the student start school within a week of that or ish, um, provides less time for, for that, you know, setting memory to get lost. And then as always, create a safe and welcoming space and be flexible. Okay, format of screening day, we get asked this a lot. So every incoming pre-K student has to have a developmental screening tool conducted. So this is a tool that's going to look at their early language and literacy, numeracy and cognitive skills, as well as their gross and fine motor skills and their personal, social and emotional development. The tools that I mentioned before, EZP, EZK, Dial, or Gantz is a, a, an example of a tool that would look at these pieces. They also all need a health screening. And that health screening is going to look at hearing, vision, and um, overall health, including oral and lead poisoning awareness. So that should be pretty similar to what you're doing for incoming kindergarten students, just on a younger student. Um, obviously, if a student comes to us wearing glasses, then we know that they have a vision home. Um, if a student comes to us with hearing aids or, or devices to help them hear, then we know that they have a, um, a hearing home. So we don't need to necessarily run them through the gamut of that. So just be mindful of, of the students that are coming to you. 
And then the professionals, right, your experts that you want present on screening day, certainly the pre-K teachers and ed techs, right, getting to know their faces and, and interacting with them, great for families and the students. Um, any partnership staff, if applicable, if, you, if you're working with a, a community partner. The school nurse, having that individual on hand is really helpful for the health screening and any questions regarding that. Um, if you can, whether it's school hired, uh, partnership hired, or an outside community member having a licensed speech, physical and or occupational therapist on hand. And then of course, any school administration or special education staff that can help answer any questions. So many of the developmental screening tools, like I said, they, they assess or they screen the um, areas of development listed above. And so some schools will set it up as a rotation, meaning the child will sit with one individual and conduct the early language and literacy section, for example. And then the child will physically move to another adult um, to complete the gross and fine motor portion and then move to another adult to complete the personal, social, and emotional piece. Um, that's up to you. That's one way of doing it. Um, it certainly moves children through at a quicker rate, potentially. Um, and the other option is stationary, meaning one adult works with one student to conduct the entire screening tool start to finish. So based on the student, based on your um, needs as a school, you can decide which is better. And then of course, always create a safe and welcoming space and be flexible. If you get nothing else from these slides today, get that out. And then the last thing to keep in mind with um, screening your students is working with CDS, your local child development services uh, site. So don't ever hesitate to reach out and ask, right? You Both of your, your entities, you're working together, you're in this together, especially around screening students for child find purposes. You can be sure to identify each other's needs and goals of the child find plan. Identify who can be present on the days of screening. It's not uncommon that your local CDS office, especially if it's um, in the summertime, has an individual, a uh, 282 perhaps, or a speech therapist that may have time and availability to be present on a screening day. Um, share any materials that, that each of you has with families. So sometimes that might be some intake forms, informational forms, brochures, things like that. If your school doesn't already have a screening tool like the dial, EZP, et cetera, then ask CDS. They may have a tool on hand that you can borrow some of the materials from to conduct screening rather than purchasing your own. And once the screening days are all done, ask if one of their uh, 282s case managers could come and meet uh, to do a review of students, especially any students that you may have developmental concerns about, right? Give them a heads up. We saw this student, this is how they performed. This is my concern. What do you think? Um, here's the family's information. And create a safe and welcoming space and be flexible. Okay, I think now I'm going to hand it over to Sue for some registration pieces. Yep. Great. Just let me get on the slide where I am. All righty. So we all know as when kindergartners come in, there's, as we start anything new, whether you're starting at a new doctor's office or whatever, the registration process always involves paperwork and all of those pieces. So develop a registration and enrollment process that really aligns with your protocol and timeline. If you're doing a lottery or if you're um, you know, going to be prioritizing students in a program that's not universal, you may not want your family to fill out your whole registration packet first thing. You may just wanna collect some key demographic information. A lot of districts use Google Forms to do this and they collect some basic info from families. And then once kiddos are accepted, they have them move forward. If you know that you're universal, you may wanna have families do that right off the bat so that they get everything in and you have that information. You wanna ensure that that registration process is accessible to families and that supports available for completing the forms. This applies to our, our you know, families that are not proficient in speaking and reading English, but also just families that may struggle with literacy and their reading ability. We wanna make sure that folks have that support. A lot of schools are doing online registration right now. We wanna make sure that families have connectivity. So there's many ways you can do that. Um, always making sure that there's a number they can call and talk to someone if they need that support. 
Consider the needs of program partners. So if you're operating in collaboration with a partner, be it a Head Start agency or a child care program, um, really consider everyone's needs in developing the registration process and the packet of information so that all the data needed is collected at one time and that we're really not asking families to complete duplicate registrations because that really puts a lot of burden on them. Um, you may want to consider including any necessary releases for sharing information with partner agencies and programs. If you're operating in collaboration, this can be, I know that there are Head Start agencies that provide oversight to the classroom and they're involved in the MTSS process for the pre-K kiddos, consulting when necessary, and all of those kiddos may not be Head Start clients. So we want to make sure the releases are there. You may want to have a release for CDS so that families know, or if you need to send information, other schools choose to do that if a referral is necessary. But sometimes it's easier to get that stuff up front and also to let families know that you are operating in collaboration. And then establish a plan for sharing registration data between partners to ensure that everyone has the needed information in a timely fashion. Head Start, just like um, schools, have a, has a student information system. And um, many childcare systems use Bright Wheel or, or some other program to track information and data. So usually that, that information is very easily shared through a data dump. You know, you can print registration packets and share that back and forth so that everybody knows who's coming in. And then as we're transitioning into our pre-K, we wanna make, again, we want to make our kiddos and our families feel safe and feel welcomed. So attention to transition programs um, in between classrooms sets up a positive tone for the future. Nicola, do you plan for me to go on or did you wanna, okay. Um, and it sets a good tone for the future experience with teachers and families. It sets children up for success and it gives them a positive outlook on school. So some ideas for transitions, organize visits to the classroom and with the teachers prior to the first day of school. Many programs do visit days. Um, you know, a lot of schools include this in their open house. Um, meet with families to discuss home language, preferred communication methods, transition concerns, health needs, individual education plans and services, and health considerations and all of those factors. Sometimes this is done as part of screening. Sometimes it's done through a home visit. There are many different ways that you can tackle that. Ensure that dual language families have information in their preferred language and have support completing their registration documents. And then schedule and notify parents of their screening days including the developmental and behavioral and hearing screenings and vision screenings, and contact CDS for IEP information and the scheduling of services for children with current plans, reaching out to find out who they have that, that they see is coming your way is really beneficial and they can provide some additional info. And then opening the floor to other ideas and strategies. Are there things that you have planned for transition? I did get to go to a great webinar last week where we talked about one of the, um, is in another state, but they talked about their kindergarten and they do the same for pre-K roundup. And they have a day where there are stations, they enlist high school athletes to help out. They have community partner agencies there with information from families and it is their screening and they're going through and doing a lot of fun things, but they also have multiple kids there at the same time and they get to see children interact. and. That is a very valuable piece of information that supplements your screening data. I know we've been trying to figure out a way to do that in the district that I've taught in for many years. And I immediately called our kindergarten team leader and our pre-K team leader and said, you've got, to, you've got to hear this idea. And they're really excited. So anything that we can get families in and some of those, you know, play and learn groups over the summer, have them in for a story time or any of those things that help them get familiar. Mm -hmm. Nicole, do you have other thoughts? Um, one of my favorite transition strategies that I've seen schools do um, is they actually utilize the expertise of their current pre-K students. Um, so those that would be technically moving on to kindergarten the next year. So they ask those current pre-K students to think about 
their year in pre-K and what they would want incoming pre-K students to know um, and to sort of set the stage for that. So they, they'll sort of write a letter or make a poster or create a small book for the income, incoming pre-K students to access that might tell them things, um, you know, when you're outside at recess, um, you know, don't go near the flagpole or whatever the it is. Um, when you're on the bus, make sure you're sitting because bus driver Nicole, you know, doesn't like it when we stand up, things like that. So sort of trans setting the stage for those incoming pre-K students. And then that information can be read or shared with the incoming students at the screening days at an open house night in a whole group or one-on-one -on -one setting. Um, and then also with that also benefits the current pre-K students moving on to kindergarten because they're sort of prepping themselves in that process to leave this space, right? Like this was our home for nine months. We're passing it on to younger students and now we're the big kids and we're moving on to kindergarten and we're gonna have a new space. So it sort of benefits both parties. Um, I always thought that was a fun idea. You know, Portland kind of builds on that and they plant sunflowers on their playground. Um, one of the schools does in the spring as part of their end of the year unit. And then they meet with their pre-K kiddos um, on the visit day and introduce them. They all get kindergarten and pre-K come in together. And then at the end of the visit, they have recess together and they each are assigned a partner and they take their partner and introduce them to their sunflower. And they the pre-K child gets then to harvest that mm -hmm. and there's sharing back and forth. So it's just a little of that, Love that. connection between kiddos. Great. So our early learning team members, um, our contact information is listed here. So if there's any reason or anything that you have a question on or need further clarification around. Any one of us can help um, navigate that for you. Please never hes hesitate to reach out to us. And then certainly um, folks here today, if you have any questions now that you'd like to ask, Sue and I are happy to um, have a conversation about that as well. <laughs>